So once again, I come unprepared <laughs> to talk to you. But uh, during our sutra class, a really good question <coughs> came up, and we circle around this question all the time and try to find a way to solve the problem. And uh, koans were one solution to the problem. And we've talked about those a number of times before. And the problem is, how do I deal with what I believe as compared to what other people believe who don't agree with me? And to put it in a more even positive way, how do I deal with being right and they're wrong? Mm -hmm. And to make it even worse, how do I deal with always being right and some people always being wrong? And uh, that's, that's a tough problem. We have many historical examples of monks who were uh, very strong practitioners of meditation, very uh, strong in their uh, monk's life, who were great scholars. And one of my favorite stories is about a monk who um, had studied the sutras, he'd written many books on the sutras, and um, <clears throat> I always get nervous when monks become too famous. Some of you know that. Uh, I start to be a little uh, leery of them that they missed the point when they became too famous, particularly when they have too many books out. I really felt kind of good. We have a number of books on our shelf by the Dalai Lama. At least it has his name on it. And uh, I, I've never read a book by the Dalai Lama. I mean, he's a really nice guy, but we, you know, I have so many choices around here, and sometimes the choice is, do I go rake up the leaves or do I read a book by the Dalai Lama? Well, it seems like the leaves are gonna win. So I go rake up the leaves. And so I started reading this book, and it was, his, his books are pretty much always about the same subject, you know, about being nice and not being angry and accepting things as they are. And the first thing I realized is that he didn't write the book. And then I went back and I looked at some of the other books on the shelf and realized he didn't write these books either. Now he's got somebody who's come in and, and, and interviewing him and then writing down what the Dalai Lama said. And so you get uh, somebody who's probably a, a famous scholar, except I don't know who they are, and they go to the Dalai Lama, how come you're always happy? And then the Dalai Lama tells him why he's always happy. And then, how come you smile so much? And, and he's, you know, he says, well, life is a wonderful thing. And how come you laugh so much? Because life's a ridiculous thing. You know, and it just goes on and on like that. And I realized the Dalai Lama didn't write this book. But he's got a nice picture on the cover. I mean, you know, the Dalai Lama is a poster boy for uh, living a happy life uh, from that standpoint. But we get, we get back to this problem of being right. And uh, <clears throat> it's a difficult problem, particularly when you have an education. Uh, and this one monk who's very famous, he'd written all these uh, commentaries on the different sutras. And uh, at sutra class today, I walked in late, <clears throat> have a little bit of a cold, and got, got moving slow. And, and uh, a lady had asked, because uh, it was her first time at the class, um, who wrote the sutra? When, you know, it, it was fair questions. Who wrote the sutra? When was it written? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, like that. So I, I went to answer that. And of course, I'm so so concise in my answers, it only took me 20 minutes to answer that, at which time her eyes had completely glazed over and she was, had learned to be careful about what she asked because she would get too much of an answer. Uh, this monk was kind of like that. And uh, he put a great deal of stock in all these sutras that he'd studied. And, and he studied basically everything that was available at the time. And he traveled from temple to temple and he would debate with the different monks there about the meaning they found in the sutras until he ran into a true master. And the, his encounter with the true master went something like, uh, you know, what is the essential nature of life? And the true master reached over and went. <laughs> and the 
monk said, no, 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 I ask you, what was the essential nature of life? Well, this is too far away. Ah. And so the master, in those days, they all had a stick. And they kept the stick at hand, very often in their lap. And he reached out and swatted the guy with a stick. And this monk is getting really frustrated because he's used to traveling. He's a scholar. He even wears a funny hat that shows he's a scholar in China. And he's used to going into these temples. And the first thing he's used to is everybody's impressed. Okay, that's, that's the first thing he encounters. And of course, when people are impressed with you, you've got a great advantage. Because obviously they assume you know something so that anything you say, they, they give it uh, a certain amount of value. And so finally he said to the teacher, he said, I don't understand anything you're doing. This makes no sense to me. Who are you? And the master went, ah! And the monk got up and walked out, went back to where his things were, dug out all his commentaries on the sutras, built up a pile of them and burned them all to the ground and said, my life has been a total waste. And the master came by and slapped him in the back of the head. And he realized, no, his life had not been a total waste. It is about this moment. It is not about being right or wrong. Right or wrong are okay. This is a great deal of confusion. We talk about non-discrimination. I love the show Kung Fu, which everybody's too young to remember but it had David Carradine in it. And I watched it for half a year and didn't realize he was supposed to be a monk. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't have a color TV. So I did. And then one day I was over at my mother's house and I said, can I watch Kung Fu because it's on now? And she said, sure. And, and she had a color TV and all of a sudden here's this guy in a yellow robe. And I went, wait a minute, he's a monk. What's he doing going around hitting people? And so I went to school the next day. I was in college at the time, and my best friend in college and I were the same age. We, you know, had some of the same experiences. We started college at about 25, and, and uh, we used to always talk about this show. And I said, he's a monk. He says, what do you mean he's a monk? And I said, he had a color TV, by the way. I said, he's got a yellow robe. And I said, what's that going to do with it? I said, well, monks wear yellow robes, and he doesn't have any hair. And why is he going around hitting everybody? Because, you know, the great myth about Bodhidharma starting Kung Fu and all of that, that business, which is sacrosanct to all the martial artists, that martial arts are really a religious experience. If you can, you know, knock somebody out with one blow, then your, your religious power is extreme. And if you truly have, truly have enlightenment, I can reach out like this. I know how to do this, by the way. I can reach out like this without touching you and cause your heart to stop because I'm enlightened. So you've seen in Kung Fu movies, right? I had a disciple he loved. The worse it was, the better he liked it. He loved these things out of Hong Kong where the lips would be moving at a <clears throat> rapid speed and the guy would say, so where is your mama? And his <laughs> lips would be going at this rapid speed. And we loved to watch those things, and we never took any of it very seriously. But they were a lot of fun to watch. But that, that monk realized after a lifetime, <coughs> what seemed like a lifetime at the time, that all of this study and, and scholarship and debates and winning debates had not brought him any closer into, into the realm of happiness. And we talked today a little bit about in the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra gets so fantastical in the descriptions it has of reality between the bodhisattvas and the various beings and the wondrous skies and the sunshine and the clouds and I don't know. And um, but hi, what, what is it you say? It's full of adjectives. Yeah, he just he goes, OK, I read the chapter. It's just even more adjectives. And it just gets so terribly elaborate. And yet, the universe in one sense is very elaborate. But these descriptions are over, almost overwhelming. And the reality is, it's just 
looking up and seeing the sky. It's standing there in the morning and watching the sun come up. That's, that's a tremendous thing. If you get a scientist to describe what just took place, he can write book after book, and they have, over what takes place when the sun comes up. It's such a phenomenal thing. And yet it's also a very simple thing. And so the great master Lin Chi, which those of you that have taken precepts at this temple, you have the great master Lin Chi in your lineage, he used to repeatedly say that it's much easier to teach a farmer than it is a scholar. Because scholars have so many ideas in their head that they, they can't let go of them. And farmers are too busy just going out raking leaves, you know, and, and planting a, a potato or a, a carrot and just doing the everyday things. And so they keep things very simple. Americans, we had a lady here last week, um, and she was from Chicago. It was a small group of Vietnamese people that came here. This one lady who I, the other people were familiar to me. They brought food, which those of you watching this video, if you want to come visit me, always bring food. And they brought, they brought food, which immediately put them on my inner circle. <laughs> yes. and, and so she started asking me questions. Uh, and some of them were easy questions to answer. One of the things she wanted to know is, what was the difference, I don't know where she got this from, what was the difference between Japanese Buddhism and Vietnamese Buddhism? <laughs> well, have you got a lifetime and then we can go into this in depth? And uh, I, I looked in our library for a book by Beatrice Suzuki, which was a very, very simple book, but that's what she addressed, she would not that, not compare and contrast, she just wrote a small book on Japanese Buddhism, the different schools in Japanese Buddhism. And so I thought, well, maybe if I can find that book, I can give it to her. And, and it turned out she was from Chicago, so I knew I was donating it to her, but I couldn't find the book. And she said, well, when I come back again, you can do the book. But um, this, this thing that we have going on here in this country, there's People are very comfortable with Japanese Buddhism. And I think a lot of times they don't even know why they're very comfortable with Japanese Buddhism. But they like a lot of the, uh, oh, the exterior things. They like Japanese gardens and they like Japanese architecture, which by the way copies Chinese architecture, but the Japanese would never, ever admit that, you know. and. Uh, and there was an inspiration. Almost everything that we call Zen in Japan, and D.T. Suzuki wrote that if you scratch, just scratch the surface of Japanese culture, you, you, it bleeds Zen. That's what's underneath it. But if you look at the architecture, you look at the gardens, you look at the paintings, uh, even the poetry, all of it was highly influenced by the Chinese version of it, which is not the same because Chinese people and Japanese people are completely different people in the way they approach things. But Americans, they really like the black and white stuff. They really like the simplicity. Not all of them. Because to me, the second most popular school in this country is Tibetan Buddhism. That's for the people that like loud noises and lots of bells ringing and bright colors and you know, and all of that stuff that they do in Tibetan Buddhism that they don't do in Japanese Buddhism. So, but I think that's a smaller school. So we're, you know, we have this Puritan background, this Protestant background, which likes simplicity. And uh, Japanese Buddhism at its very best emphasizes that simplicity. Except when you start thinking that you're right and then you get into trouble. And this happens within Buddhism just as much as it happens with any other philosophy or religion. People start thinking they're right because they practice a particular form. And then they fall into the trap. And the trap is needing to be right. The trap is not being right. The trap is needing to be right. And you know that you need to be right when you disagree with someone. 
and you know that you start moving towards freedom when it's not necessary to tell somebody they're wrong. Even though you're absolutely, totally convinced that they're wrong. But you don't have to tell them that. You just go, oh, okay. So I have my story, which I tell at least three times a year, that Sandy loves. But she's heard it so many times. And that is the story of the 18th century Japanese master, Hakuan. And in the village, there's a young woman who becomes pregnant. And the father is the village headman or mayor, or whatever you want to call him. And uh, he gets a little upset because his daughter's pregnant. And he says to her, who's the father? Well, the father is a young man in the village who's 18, 19 years old. And he's already left to go to the big city to make his fortune. And the daughter doesn't want to get him in trouble. So she says the first thing that comes to her mind, it's the monk out at the old temple. And so <clears throat> the father takes the girl and his wife and a couple other people with big sticks after the baby's born, mind you goes out and beats on the door of the temple, and Hakuin opens the door of the temple. Now, you have to understand about Hakuin. Hakuin was a bit of a character, and he moved out into the countryside. They'd had these civil wars going on for a couple hundred years, and an awful lot of the temples had suffered because of that. There were no monks in this temple. The temple was half burned down. The roofs all leaked. It was a mess. He moved out there and started practicing, and every once in a while he would fix something, but he did a lot of meditation. And Hakuan is so important that in the Rinzai school, every school in the Rinzai school has him in their lineage, because the Rinzai school almost disappeared. But Hakuan came along and revitalized it, and pointed out the, <laughs> that what we were doing was about enlightenment. It wasn't about fancy robes, and it wasn't about status and position. And it wasn't about being right. It was about understanding the nature of the universe and ourselves. <clears throat> he was also the, the Japanese monk that spread the word that enlightenment was not a singular event. That enlightenment was a process that continued on all through your life. And that was something that is not necessarily accepted in the Buddhist world uh, commonly. It's in many places, and I'm talking about countries and traditions, it's still looked at that enlightenment is a singular event. And once you're enlightened, well, it's all done. Okay? And there's nothing more to do. So, Hakuin's living out there, and he doesn't quite know this yet. And the father comes and yells at him a lot and waves a stick in the air and says, you did this. And Hakuin looks at the baby and the little girl's in the background shaking, and the father says, here, this is your fault. And Hakuin says, oh, is that so? Takes the baby. Everybody stomps off. Hakuin takes the baby inside. We don't know what he thought, but we know that the next day he got up and he went to a farmer and he asked for milk for the baby. And we know that over the months this went on, that Hakuin had to travel further and further to get milk because as soon as the word spread that he had had sex with a woman, and particularly a young girl, he was really not a monk anymore and he was disgraced. And for those of you that study such things, you know the Koreans and the Japanese, I never can remember which one's which, having been both places, <laughs> he can tell me. Do the Japanese carry the baby on the front or the back? Front. Yeah. Okay, so the Koreans carry the baby on the back. Mm -hmm. But the moms both have a, a harness where they can carry the baby. So when they go out to work, they've always got their baby with them. So Hakuin made one of those harnesses and he carried this baby. And every day he would get up and he would have to travel a further and further distance to get milk because he would come up. Now he's in robes, he's dressed like me, and he's got a baby strapped mm -hmm. to his back. And he's coming up to a farmer and he's going, could I please have some milk for my baby? And 
you know, can just imagine what's that like because monks, you know, they don't they don't have babies. And Hockman didn't offer any any explanation. He just said, I need some, the baby is hungry, I need some milk. So it became a thing of where every day he got up and he traveled the whole day to get milk for the baby and came back to the temple. And of course, by at some point he was starting to feed the baby some mashed up rice and stuff like this. And quite a long time went by. It had to be a long time. It had probably was a couple of years because the young man made his fortune in the city and he got a good position and a good job, as we would say. And he came back to the village. Now, he didn't know anything about this. He didn't know what had happened. And he went back to see the girl. He didn't even know she was pregnant. And he came back and said, I want to talk to your father about getting married. I've got a good job. I can support you. You know, I can give your mom and dad a little bit of money. And the girl had to admit that she'd had a baby and that she'd uh, told her dad that the monk was the father of the baby. And, and so then they went to mom and dad and he apologized and he explained and he, that he didn't, you know, and just imagine, you've seen it on television. He did the whole routine. And now, now the dad, who's a very influential character, he's so influential that nobody in the surrounding community will help the monk in any way because he has spread the word far and wide that this monk is not a real monk, that he's a demon, and that he, you know, did this to his daughter. And so here he is. And they go to the door of the temple once again, and the young man's there, and the daughter's there, and the mom's there, and the, the dad's there, the the headman of the, of the village is there, and they knock on the door, and Hakuin comes to the door. And so now the dad goes through this long apology of saying, I was wrong, and I'm so sorry, and I caused you all these problems, and what can I possibly do, and et cetera, et cetera, and my daughter's here, and this is the true father, and they're going to become married, and everything's all right now, and I'm so sorry that I completely ruined your reputation. And Hawkwin took the baby off his back because he it went everywhere with this baby and handed the baby back. And the father said, so do you forgive me? And Hawkwin said, ah, oh, is that so? Oh, and bowed and closed the door. Can you do that? Can you let go? Hakuin never had any attachment to who he was. Hakuin never thought he was anybody special from the time he started the practice of the Zen until the time he died. It's a very difficult thing to not take yourself seriously. Hakuin took the practice intensely seriously. He practiced hours and hours a day. When he wasn't practicing, he was working at the temple but he never took himself particularly seriously. By the time he died, he had hundreds of students. They lived in this temple with a, with a leaky roof, and they complained all the time. They say, Master, the roof leaks. He goes, I know. He said, well, we should fix the roof. He says, well, we either can do meditation or we can fix the roof. Mm, I think we ought to do meditation. He frustrated them like crazy. But he never argued with him. He just said, okay, let's get, to, you know, if today he would have said, let's go get some tarps and put them over the top of us so we don't get too wet while this goes on. It's a very difficult thing. It's not difficult to be right. It's difficult to worry about being right. It's certainly not difficult to be wrong. Because all of us are wrong on a regular basis, just like all of us are right on a regular basis. What's difficult is not to worry about it too much. It's just to relax and exhale and take it easy and move on. Because there's always important stuff to do. There's rakes, leaves to rake. There's silverware to move from the drawer. Mm -hmm. 
to the table. You know, there's all these things to do. And all we need to do is just do them. And not take ourselves too seriously. So I want to make a couple, well, yeah, go ahead and stop that.